In September 1991, shortly after the end of the Cold War, a cabal of elite bankers and intelligence spooks led by George H.W. Bush financed a $240 billion covert operations war chest through the purchase of 10-year securities that, as it happened, were scheduled to come due on September 12, 2001. Project Hammer was undoubtedly used for a wide variety of illicit intelligence operations, but mainly it was used to finance a covert economic operation against the collapsing Soviet Union, whereby unknown Western investors bought up much of the Soviet industry with a focus on oil and gas, crashing the Russian economy, looting its central bank, orchestrating what became known as the Great Ruble Scam, and a wide variety of other clandestine state-assisted operations designed to thoroughly prevent Russia from ever contesting the U.S. as a world superpower. While in the process lining the pockets of these economic hitmen who swooped in to devour the collapsing Russian economy after the fall of the Soviet Union. A spectacular investment for all, at least until money laundering investigations began tracing all the money, or when the 10-year deadline came up and the securities became due and began the routine process of authenticity and ownership checks. Evidence shows that several federal and private investigations had already stumbled upon the Hammer Fund and were compiling evidence on it up until the 9-11 attacks. These included the Office of Naval Intelligence, or ONI, which was moved to the outer E-ring of the recently renovated section of the Pentagon that was targeted and destroyed on 9-11. According to E.P. Heidner, the ONI had been investigating crimes associated with the plundering of Russia. 39 out of the 40 people who worked in those offices were killed on 9-11, including the entire chain of command. The Pentagon's financial accounting offices in that same wing were also an obvious target, as were the passengers on board Flight 77, many of whom coincidentally held top-secret clearances and were connected with Pentagon black operations. Agents of the Office of Naval Intelligence had also been investigating financial transactions which were linked to securities being managed by those securities dealers in the World Trade Center that were also targeted. 31% of the 125 fatalities in the Pentagon were from the Naval Command Center that housed the Office of Naval Intelligence. 41% of the fatalities in the Twin Towers came from two companies that managed U.S. government securities, Cantor Fitzgerald and Eurobrokers. There were three major security brokers in the World Trade Center, Cantor Fitzgerald, Eurobrokers, and Garbin Intercapital. At 8.46 on the morning of September 11th, Flight 11 flew directly into Martian McLennan's secure computer room in the North Tower, right below the floor on which Cantor Fitzgerald was situated. Cantor Fitzgerald was the largest security dealer in the U.S. Shortly after that, a massive explosion went off just under the FBI offices in the North Tower on the 23rd floor. Fires were reported on the 22nd floor at 8.47. There were also explosions and subsequent fires reported at Garbin Intercapital on the 25th floor and in the basement of Tower 1 as well. Shortly thereafter at 9.03, Flight 175 hit the South Tower right below the floors on which Eurobrokers was situated. In all three cases, the explosive, fiery destruction consumed the offices and the several floors above, destroying files and trapping victims inside. In the midst of all this, Building 6 was destroyed by an explosion that took place before either tower fell. This secondary explosion took out a portion of the building which just happened to include the El Dorado Task Force's offices. The El Dorado Task Force was an interagency money laundering watchdog group responsible for coordinating all major money laundering investigations in the U.S. In the immediate aftermath of September 11th, these groups would be redirected to investigate terrorist financing. Building 6 was located directly between the North Tower and World Trade Center Building 7. While large portions of World Trade Center 6 were gutted by explosions and later by falling debris from the North Tower, the building itself did not suffer a global symmetric collapse at near freefall acceleration as did buildings 1, 2, and 7. FEMA photographer and 9-11 whistleblower Kurt Sunfield took some interesting pictures of the U.S. Customs Vault in the basement of World Trade Center 6, which was found completely empty and left with the door wide open. All of its contents appear to have been looted during the attacks. There is also evidence that gold was being looted from the vaults beneath World Trade Center 4. There were several early reports of a 10-wheel truck packed with stolen bullion caught fleeing World Trade Center 5 when the vehicle had become stuck on a collapsed ceiling brace, forcing the driver to flee the scene. 
Many researchers have stumbled across one or two of these anomalies from time to time, the empty vaults, the secondary explosions, the fireproofing upgrades on the exact floors coinciding with failure and impact in the towers, the suspicious power downs and evacuation drills, the World Trade Center tenants and security firms like AIG, Martian McLennan, and Kroll, and their close ties with the intelligence community, etc., etc. These anomalies are not unrelated, but nevertheless became lost inside the chaos of that September morn the aftermath, and subsequent cover-ups. Okay, so what does all this mean? Overall, a critical mass of brokers from the major government security brokerages in the Twin Towers had to be eliminated to create chaos in the government securities market. A situation needed to be created wherein $240 billion of covert securities could be electronically cleared without anyone asking questions, which happened when the Federal Reserve declared an emergency and invoked its emergency powers that very afternoon. On September 14th, the Securities and Exchange Commission declared a national emergency and for the first time in U.S. history invoked its emergency powers under the Securities Exchange Act Section 12K and eased regulatory restrictions for clearing and settling security trades for the next 15 days. These changes would have allowed the estimated $240 billion in covert government securities to be cleared upon maturity without the standard regulatory controls around identification of ownership. The towers needed to be demolished to create a big enough mess that the illicit activities taking place behind the scenes that morning could be hidden in the confusion of that day. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about who did it and how. 9-11 whistleblower Richard Andrew Grove was a software salesperson for a company called Silverstream. Silverstream's technology was on the cutting edge of internet solutions, offering software to web-enable the critical business functions of Fortune 500 companies, basically integrating and making available on the web the disparate legacy applications and mainframes while simultaneously streamlining workflow and traditional paper processes, with an end result being a lower cost of operation and more efficient transactions. Silverstream had built internet transactional and trading platforms for Merrill Lynch, Deutsche Bank, Bankers Trust, Alex Brown, and Morgan Stanley, to name a few. Leading up to 9-11, Silverstream was designing specialized accounting software for a major client, Marsh & McLennan. Marsh is the world's largest insurance brokerage and was located right below Cantor Fitzgerald in the North Tower. Approximately 295 Marsh employees were murdered that morning along with other innocent victims and employees who either knew too much or too little about their chosen work environment. But most importantly, Silverstream provided a specific type of connectivity that was used to link AIG and Marsh and McLennan, the first two commercial companies on the planet to employ this type of transaction. What then were Marsh and AIG doing, and why did they need to leverage technologies that no other commercial entity on the face of the earth needed to use to conduct business? The recovered hard drives from the World Trade Center, combined with Richard Grove's testimony, give us some intriguing clues. Grove discovered that Silverstream was overbilling Marsh to the tune of seven million extra dollars for fictitious and unneeded hardware. He also became aware of an exploitable flaw in the accounting software that had been sold to a variety of Marsh's clients and partners. When he brought this up to his superiors at Silverstream and others at Marsh, he was told to keep quiet and not to worry about it. But other friends of his at Marsh were also getting concerned and began documenting what was going on and raising concerns within the company. At last, they were finally granted a hearing with one of Marsh's high-ranking executives and were told to bring all their evidence to a hearing scheduled for 8.30 a.m. on September 11, 2001, on the 93rd floor. The high-ranking member of Marsh, who Grove did not name, would participate via teleconference from the safety of his home, while Marsh employees and potential whistleblowers, Gary Lasko, Catherine Lee, Ken Rice, Richard Bruhart, and John Oltzhofer would die in the meeting room in the North Tower with all their evidence when American Airlines Flight 11 would impact that very section of the building. Richard Grove fortunately got stuck in traffic that morning and didn't make it. Computer hard drives recovered from the World Trade Center show a spike in suspicious transfers that took place within the World Trade Center as the 9-11 attacks were unfolding. Richard Grove is convinced that these suspicious money transfers were performed electronically using Silverstream software and that the overbilling of Marsh was hush money for the operations. It would certainly have helped clear up that $240 billion in securities and make it look like any of those companies might have done it. The recovered hard drives and financial transactions from 9-11 all show clear evidence that something was going on that morning. Marsh's CEO at the time was Jeffrey Greenberg, the son of Maurice Greenberg of AIG. 
Most insurance companies were hurting badly in late 2001 after $40 billion in insurance settlements had been paid out for the devastation caused by the 9-11 attacks. Yet one insurance company did not suffer quite the same losses as the other companies did. American International Group, or AIG as it turns out, is much more than an insurance company. With its long ties to the intelligence community, AIG was founded by OSS operative Cornelius B. Starr, two R's, the uncle of Clinton's friend Kenneth Starr. AIG currently operates a complex network of shell companies and other entities which operate internationally and have been used for clandestine intelligence gathering and other covert activities for decades. The company that ran security in the World Trade Center, Kroll Associates, was owned by AIG. The CEO of AIG on 9-11 was a guy named Morris Greenberg, who was actually nominated for the position of Director of Central Intelligence after he authored a report for the Council on Foreign Relations, of which he's a high-ranking member, where he advocated that FBI and Drug Enforcement Agency agents operating abroad should not be allowed to act independently of either the ambassador or the CIA lest pursuit of evidence or individuals for prosecution cause major foreign policy problems or complicate ongoing intelligence and diplomatic activities. Of course, this type of policy is essentially a continuation of things like Executive Order 12333 and the CIA-assisted contra cocaine trafficking that went on as an immediate result. These backdoor agreements opened the floodgates for government drug money laundering and narco-trafficking. Former LAPD narcotics detective turned whistleblower Michael Rupert has written a series of excellent articles documenting AIG's involvement in drug money laundering, undoubtedly revealing yet another motive for the invasion of Afghanistan, a country which currently produces over 90% of the world's heroin supply. Drugs are arguably the most profitable commodity on the entire international market, and drug money was undoubtedly a motive behind the invasion of Afghanistan and consequently the 9-11 attacks. While companies like AIG launder the drug money for big banks, the actual drug production and trafficking can be traced back to the same Iran-Contra affiliates like Richard Armitage and Frank Carlucci. Unfortunately, that rabbit hole is a bit too deep and off-topic to get into here. I will mention that DynCorp was heavily involved, as well as Stewart Air Force Base in upstate New York, where the two flights out of Boston crossed paths simultaneously and shut off their transponders before making their way to the Twin Towers. Many researchers believe that the MENA operation was moved to Stewart Air Force Base after Barry Seal got whacked. Richard Armitage was the Deputy Secretary of State on 9-11, and according to whistleblower Michael Springman, he was the man responsible for granting visas to 15 out of 19 of the 9-11 hijackers, allowing them to enter the U.S. and pursue flight training. Frank Carlucci is the chairman of the Carlyle Group and was in Washington, D.C. on 9-11, having just met with George H.W. Bush and the brother of Osama bin Laden on Carlyle Group business. Frank Carlucci was also the chairman of BDM International, a company that served as a front for State Department black operations. Frank Carlucci's employees at BDM International left to take charge of Stratasec, the World Trade Center and airport security firm. Corporate Operating Officer Barry W. McDaniel, an ex-military expert in logistics and materials distribution, and CEO Wirt Dexter Walker III, who was a distant Bush cousin from the Herbert Walker line, with an extensive history of managing CIA front companies. Marvin Bush, the president's brother, was also a board member at Stratasec, although Stratasec maintained contracts for security upgrades which were set to expire on September 11, 2001, they were not the company officially charged with World Trade Center security. This role was assigned to a risk management firm called Kroll Associates. Kroll's chairman, Jerome Hauer, was a longtime personal friend of ex-FBI counterterrorism expert John O'Neill and was responsible for O'Neill's appointment as head of security for the World Trade Center just a few days prior to the 9-11 attacks. O'Neill was the world's leading expert on Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and was a potential 9-11 whistleblower with hard evidence of White House complicity in the protection and shielding of the 9-11 hijackers from all means of federal investigation. Al-Qaeda hijacking suspects were flagged by the Able Danger Terrorist Tracking Program, which was also shut down by the White House. Able Danger whistleblower Anthony Schaefer claims the U.S. government destroyed over six terabytes of data related to Able Danger, which he also claims identified 9-11 ringleader Mohammed Atta as early as February of 2000. Those atop the chain of command in the White House, military, and intelligence establishment deliberately ignored all the warning signs of an impending attack 
a clever strategy of plausible deniability which also served to portray those in charge as incompetent rather than complicit. In every major head throughout the chain of command on 9-11, from NORAD to the military, we see a repeated theme of complicity through negligence or incompetence. After 9-11, failure and incompetence was rewarded and whistleblowers were silenced. Combined with the fact that six corporations control 90% of the media and CIA operations like Mockingbird admit to taking over and subverting our U.S. media, we can understand how such a big lie could have been kept from the American public for so long. But if you stop and take the time to do your research, you'll find all the evidence is there, hidden beneath a mountain of disinfo and lies. It's been 10 years since 9-11 happened, and we are left with hundreds, if not thousands, of unanswered questions about the 9-11 attacks. A transparently fraudulent 9-11 Commission report, which purposely failed to even mention the collapse of World Trade Center 7, and a host of ridiculous so-called debunking websites, forums, and other literature, which have done absolutely nothing over the past 10 years to debunk anything other than cleverly selected straw man arguments, and have failed to stem the constant flow of new 9-11 information which researchers have been uncovering and bringing out to the public. Instead, they continue to label truth seekers, including family members of people who died on 9-11, as conspiracy theorists, and devise clever propaganda designed to prevent the general public from looking any further into the evidence or the actual claims of the so-called conspiracy theorists. In this video, we will take a deeper look into the so-called investigations which have provided us with the official story and why they deserve a more thorough examination. The Bush administration stalled government investigations into 9-11 for over 400 days. A week after 9-11, letters containing anthrax spores were mailed to several news media offices and two senators who were perhaps a bit too vocal about opening an official investigation into 9-11. The anthrax used in the attacks was identified as an AIMS strain, which means it had to have come from the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases at Fort Detrick, Maryland. A member of that institute, Jerome Hauer, managed the National Institute of Health response to the anthrax attacks. Coincidentally, Hauer also warned the White House to start taking Cipro, an antibiotic which is effective against anthrax, a week before the attacks. Jerome Hauer also happened to be a managing director at Kroll Associates, which ran security at the World Trade Center up until the weekend before 9-11, when that role was personally handed off by Hauer to FBI agent John O'Neill, who would later die in the attacks, drawing strong suspicion that he was set up due to his knowledge of Al-Qaeda and the 9-11 hijackers, whom he was blocked from investigating while he was working at the FBI. In January 2002, President Bush personally asked Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle to limit the congressional investigation into the events of September 11th. The Bush administration only formed the 9-11 Commission after being prodded by the victims' families, who lobbied Congress for over a year to open the investigations. When the Bush administration finally did open a 9-11 investigation, it was described by some members as set up to fail. The President has said only a minority of the Commission can see a minority of the documents, and then they have to clear what they're going to say to the rest of the commission with the White House. If you're one of those four that gets to see these documents, would that change your opinion? No. They don't want any more eyeballs to see their documents than they can possibly get away with. It's a scam. It's absolutely disgusting. They even attempted to appoint Henry Kissinger, a known cover-up mastermind, as head commissioner. He resigned after victims' family members asked him sensitive questions about his connections to the Bin Laden family and the Carlyle Group. Philip Zelikow wrote the conclusions for the report before the investigation ever began, and even then, any areas which did not support the official story were neither mentioned nor investigated by the 9-11 Commission. Six out of ten members of that commission have discussed on record how the government lied about the official story and 70% of the questions posed by the victims' families were never answered or officially investigated. It's important to look at what happened to the evidence from 9-11. The day of 9-11, most of the FBI was in Monterey, California on an agency retreat. Let's go to our State Department correspondent, Andrea Mitchell. Andrea, what can you tell us? Well, this from the FBI. The State Department has been evacuated. There was a meeting going on in the Operations Center. Other top officials were in the Situation Room at the White House. Colin Powell is in Bogota, Colombia on a two-day trip. But this very interesting information, Katie, Matt, and Tom, from the FBI, they had been operating a massive uh, exercise from their hostage rescue unit 
All of their top teams, about 50 personnel, helicopters, equipment, were in Monterey, California for the last two days, scheduled to fly back today commercially. So all of those people are out of place. It's fair to say, according to uh, sources that we've talked to here at NBC, that the FBI uh, rescue operations and other FBI operations are really in chaos right now because they can't reach their officials in New York. All of their phone lines are down. And now you've got all of their special experts on this stuck in Monterey, California, trying to get a military flight back because there are no longer commercial flights. So they are seriously out of pocket. And there is a real breakdown of the FBI anti-terror coordination team, which is, of course, the principal team that would lead any effort and was so effective under Jim Kostrom in New York City during the World Trade Center bomber, bombing and the TWA explosion, which, of course, turned out not to be terror. Uh, Andrea, is the state Department... This was essential for keeping the more experienced and honest members of the agency as far away from the crime scene as possible, while other agency insiders could be assigned to the investigations before their counterparts returned. Federal authorities such as FEMA and the CIA took immediate control over the crime scene and began whisking away evidence that very same night. Turner Construction, one of the primary contractors at Ground Zero, occupied the 38th floor of the North Tower and was involved in performing the fireproofing upgrades inside the towers. It has been noted that these upgrades were completed in the three years before 9-11 on floors that match up almost identically to the floors of impact and failure on 9-11. Once the cleanup was fully coordinated, the operations were consolidated under the control of two primary contractors, Amec Construction Management and Bovis Lend Lease. These are the two companies that were originally assigned to the areas of Ground Zero that included the North Tower, Amec, and the South Tower, Bovis. A truly surprising fact is that at the time of the attacks on 9-11, AMEC had just completed a $258 million refurbishment of Wedge 1 of the Pentagon, which is exactly where American Airlines Flight 77 impacted that building. Arguments over the size of the hole of the Pentagon and whether it was a plane or a missile are, in my opinion, a convenient distraction from the much bigger picture of why that section of the building was targeted and by whom. On September 10th, 2001, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld announced that $2.3 trillion in unadjusted funds were missing from the Pentagon budget. The very next day, the offices whose responsibility it was for tracking that money down were destroyed when American Airlines Flight 77 impacted that very section of the building. The only off-site backup for the Pentagon's black budget financial records was a secure federal office building in the World Trade Center complex. Strangely, it too was destroyed on 9-11. World Trade Center 7 was the largest CIA headquarters outside of Langley, Virginia, and housed offices involved in several large-scale federal investigations into massive stock market and accounting fraud. Not surprisingly, World Trade Center 7 was the first to be cleaned up and the evidence destroyed at Ground Zero. So if the Twin Towers and Building 7 were brought down in a controlled demolition, and the scientific evidence points to nanothermite, then who could have produced this and who could have put it in the buildings and how did they get it there? In the impact zone of the North Tower was a company called Marsh and McLennan, which at the time was the world's largest insurance brokerage company. One of Marsh's executives was a guy named L. Paul Bremer, who was also the chairman of the Congressional National Commission on Terrorism from 1999 to 2000 and the U.S. Ambassador at Large for Counterterrorism from 1986 to 1989. Instead of going to work on the day of 9-11 and dying inside the towers with hundreds of his employees, Bremer decided to go on MSNBC and tell the world that Osama bin Laden was behind the attacks and possibly Iraq and Iran. And then he demanded the most severe military response we can come up with. L. Paul Bremer was called away from Marsh in 2003 to become the Iraq occupation governor, a role he has been widely criticized for. So Bremer not only worked inside the buildings, but had offices directly in the impact zone of the South Tower where Flight 175 would hit. He missed work on 9-11 to give us the official story on national television and went on to be the Iraq occupation governor. You really can't get more connected to 9-11 than that. Oh wait, you can, sorry. I forgot to mention that Bremer was also the former manager for Kissinger Associates. He was a member of the board for Axo Nobel, the parent of International Paint Company, which produced a fireproofing application for skyscrapers called Interchar. Bremer was also on the International Advisory Board for the Japanese mining and machinery company Komatsu, which at the time had been involved in a joint venture agreement with Dresser Industries, the oil services intelligence front where Prescott Bush Sr. and George H.W. Bush got their start with Neil Mallon. Anyway, the Komatsu Dresser Mining Division operated from 1988 to 1990 
1997, and in July 1996, it patented a nanothermite demolition device that could, quote, demolish a concrete structure at high efficiency while preventing a secondary problem due to noise, flying chips and dust, and the like. As many of you know, residues of thermite, a highly energetic chemical mixture, have been confirmed in samples of World Trade Center dust, and the use of thermite at the World Trade Center was also revealed by environmental data. See the description for more links and sources. Scientific Applications International Corporation, a defense contractor with expertise in thermite-related technologies, played a large part in the NIST World Trade Center investigation. A few other names and companies inside the Twin Towers also worthy of further investigation include Craig Stapleton, who is married to Bush's cousin Dorothy Walker Bush. Stapleton was the president of Marsh Real Estate Advisors from 1982 to 2001. He was a member of the board of directors for Sendant, that was charged with massive accounting fraud in 1998, and went on to join Winston Partners, a privately owned investment firm founded in 1993 and led by George W. Bush's brother, Marvin. Other very powerful and well-connected people worked in senior management at Marsh. These included Stephen Friedman, a senior principal at Marsh Capital and, and former partner at Goldman Sachs, who later became George W. Bush's top economic advisor. Friedman was also a member of the Brookings Institution, the Bilderberg Group, the Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board, and the board at InQtel, the investment firm founded by the CIA in 1998. InQtel invests in state-of-the-art technologies related to defense and intelligence work, including nano and chemical technologies, according to its website. In another interesting coincidence, Friedman belonged through Cornell University to a secret society called Quill and Dagger, the membership of which includes Paul Wolfowitz, Sandy Berger, and Stephen Hadley. Wolfowitz, the neocon deputy secretary of defense in the Bush administration, was the author in 1992 of the Wolfowitz Doctrine of Preemptive Warfare. He also made comments about a surprise like Pearl Harbor months before 9-11 and met with Pakistani ISI General Mahmoud Ahmed in the week before 9-11. Berger, the national security advisor to President Clinton, was later caught stealing documents from the 9-11 Commission investigation. Berger was also the boss of White House counterterrorism czar Richard Clark, and together with Hadley, who was Condoleezza Rice's deputy, was responsible for delaying or obstructing Clark's plans to stop al-Qaeda in January of 2001. Jeffrey Greenberg resigned from Marsh and McLennan after being accused of serious financial crimes. The first plane of 9-11 flew directly into his company's secure computer room in the North Tower. Jeffrey Greenberg is a member of the Brookings Institution and the Trilateral Commission. Jeffrey Greenberg rose quickly through management at Marsh, having come there directly from AIG in 1995, and then becoming CEO just four years later. At Brookings, Greenberg hobnobbed with Lee Hamilton, co-chair of the 9-11 Commission. There's also Jim Pierce, another Bush cousin, who was managing director of Aon Corporation, who, according to the NIST report, modified unknown sections of floor 83 in the South Tower in 1997. Jim Pierce had arranged a meeting on the 105th floor of the South Tower for that morning. Pierce survived that day, despite the fact that 12 people came to the meeting in the South Tower and 11 of them died. The location of the meeting had been changed the night before to the Millennium Hotel where Pierce watched the South Tower as it was hit by the aircraft. Apparently, the meeting attendees were not all notified of the change in location. Another interesting character is Joseph Kasputis of Baseline Financial Service, which occupied the impact zone of the South Tower on floors 77 and 78, where United Airlines 175 impacted. Kasputis has a history of being well-connected to the highest levels of government, as well as to the defense and intelligence industries. Kasputis worked from 1972 to 1977 for the U.S. Department of Commerce and Defense. He was also the deputy director of Nixon's White House task force that dealt with the Arab oil embargo of 1973, and was instrumental in the creation of the Department of Energy. Kasputis went on to run a large corporation called Primark that had offices in both towers on 9-11. One of the subsidiaries of Primark, the Analytical Sciences Corporation, TASC worked with so-called black or top-secret programs. TASC also worked closely with the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Kasputis was also a member of the Logistics Management Institute, LMI, whose members included Paul Kaminsky of InQtel and General Dynamics, Charles De Bona of Halliburton, Skull and Bones member Joseph Samuel Nye, and Michael Daniels of Scientific Applications International Corporation. LMI's self-proclaimed role is advancing the science of government. 
Kasputi's connections to the DOE from 1977 through at least 1997 are interesting considering that the DOE was developing thermite ignition devices as early as 1983. Joseph Kasputis went on to become the CEO of Baseline Financial Services, which was directly in the impact zone on the 78th floor of the South Tower. According to NIST, Kasputis Baseline Financial modified the southeast corner of floor 78 in 1999, exactly where the aircraft hit on 9-11. Floors 77 and 78 were upgraded for fireproofing in June and April of 1998, respectively. Another company of interest on floor 91, just above the impact zone for the South Tower, was Washington Group International. This company was known primarily as a construction and mining firm, and it had just acquired Raytheon engineers in July of 2000. In 1996, Washington took over Morrison Knudsen, an engineering and construction firm that had a history of working on large-scale projects around the world, including in China, Iran, Afghanistan, and Saudi Arabia. The Army Corps of Engineers hired Morrison Knudsen to demolish over 200 buildings in 1995. One of the DOE facilities for which Washington was responsible well before 9-11 was the Savannah River site near Aiken, South Carolina. In February of 1997, Lawrence Livermore National Labs and the Savannah River site signed an agreement of cooperation to share technology. Savannah went on to add developing sol gel technology for fuels and other applications to its portfolio. Sol gel technology is utilized by Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories for making nanothermites. In another coincidence, Savannah River Technology staff participated in the search and rescue operations at Ground Zero by providing unique tools. Just before 9-11, Washington was going through a tough time financially and sought Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. Securities and Exchange Commission documents show that Washington made court-ordered pre-petition payments as part of these proceedings to a number of companies, including Komatsu. Washington also made payments to Greenhorn and Omara, whose employee, Teresa McAllister, was a lead author of the FEMA and NIST reports on the World Trade Center disaster, and to Sumitomo Bank, which was closely allied with Komatsu. Building 7 was a 47-story federal office building in the World Trade Center site, which collapsed at 5.20 p.m. on the afternoon of 9-11. This building was home to the CIA, in fact, the largest CIA headquarters outside of Langley, Virginia. It also housed offices for the Secret Service and the Securities and Exchange Commission. One of the most interesting tenants, however, was then Mayor Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management and its Emergency Command Center on the 23rd floor. This floor received $15 million worth of renovations, including independent and secure air and water supplies and bullet and bomb resistant windows designed to withstand 200 mile per hour winds. Mayor Giuliani was a former U.S. prosecutor for the South District of New York from 1983 to 1989, who was in charge of investigating the terrorist financing Bank of Credit and Commerce International. After he left his job as a prosecutor to start a political career, he worked for a law firm called White and Case that actually represented BCCI. So he went from prosecuting the BCCI to working for a law firm which defended the BCCI. This was likely his foot in the door of this underground corporate criminal network. Giuliani would later help to destroy all the crime scene evidence from Ground Zero. Giuliani's sidekick on 9-11 was Police Commissioner Bernard Carrick, who appeared to be coaching some of Rudy's actions that day, keeping him away from the media and even answering questions for him about explosives in the buildings. In fact, Bernard Carrick gave us the first official government pronouncement that no explosives were involved in the destruction of the World Trade Center buildings. Carrick's department was also the same one that found that pristine, completely undamaged hijacker's passport, which survived a plane impact and fireball, which destroyed two titanium black boxes and three towers. Yeah, Carrick would later receive a nomination from President Bush to become Director of Homeland Security, which he declined for personal and political reasons, and instead took a job training the Iraqi police force in Iraq alongside L. Paul Bremer. Both men are credited for turning Iraq into the unwinnable quagmire it is today. In February of 2010, Carrick was sentenced to four years in federal prison for conspiracy and fraud charges, unrelated to the crimes of 9-11, unfortunately, but it still goes to show you what kind of person he is. Definitely the kind of person you'd want inside the New York City police force during a staged event like 9-11. 
And lastly, we have the Pentagon. It's certainly peculiar, to say the least, that Al-Qaeda terrorists hell-bent on destroying the USA would not crash their plane into the north wing of the Pentagon, where all the most important offices were, like Donald Rumsfeld, John Ashcroft, etc., and that they would instead choose to target the one section of the Pentagon that had most recently been refurbished to withstand missile impacts. It's also interesting to note that the company which completed the $258 million refurbishment to Wedge 1 of the Pentagon was also hired as a contractor to clean up Ground Zero in New York City. Wedge 1 also coincidentally housed the Pentagon's Budget Analyst Office, where DoD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that was reported missing by Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld in a press conference the day before 9-11. The Pentagon's comptroller in charge of that money at the time was an interesting fellow named Dov Zakheim, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, the International Institute for Strategic Studies, and a contributor to the neocon think tank project for the new American century. Zakheim helped write the PNAC document Rebuilding America's Defenses, in which he is credited for the line which states, Further, the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Several members of the Bush administration, including President Bush himself, would later refer to 9-11 as a new Pearl Harbor. A respected and established voice in the intelligence community, his views were eagerly accepted. And Dov went from his position at Systems Planning Corporation to become the comptroller of the Pentagon in May of 2001. Perhaps not so coincidentally, it was an SPC subsidiary, Tridata Corporation, that oversaw the investigation after the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in 1993. SPC, according to their official website, specializes in many areas of defense technology production and manufacture, including a system developed by their radar physics group called the Flight Termination System, or FTS. This is a system used to destroy target drones, craft that would be fired on by test aircraft or weaponry in the event of malfunctions or misses. This highly sophisticated war game technology allows the control of several drones from a remote location on varying frequencies and has a range of several hundred miles. This technology can be used on many different types of aircraft including large passenger jets. According to the SPC website, a recent customer at that time was Eglin Air Force Base, located in Florida. Eglin is very near another Air Force Base in Florida, MacDill Air Force Base, where, where Dov Zakheim contracted to send at least 32 Boeing 767 aircraft as part of the Boeing Pentagon Tanker Lease Agreement. As the events of September 11, 2001 occurred, little was mentioned about these strange coincidences and the proximity of Dov Zakheim and his group. Since there was little physical evidence remaining after the events, investigators were only left with photographic and anecdotal evidence. This is a photograph of the flight termination system module from their site. Note it has a cylindrical shape and is consistent with the size and shape of the object observed under the fuselage of Flight 175. The Boeing lease deal involved the replacement of the aging KC-135 tanker fleet with these smaller, more efficient that Boeing 767s, which were to be leased by Dov Zakheim's group. The planes were to be refitted with refueling equipment, including lines and nozzle assemblies. In this enlargement of Flight 175, we can clearly see a cylindrical object under the fuselage and a structure that appears to be attached to the right underside of the rear fuselage section. When seen in comparison, it is obvious that the plane approaching the Trade Center has both these structures, the FTS module, and the mid-air refueling equipment, as configured on the modified Boeing 767 tankers. Of particular interest is the long, tube-like anomalous structure under the rear fuselage area of 175. This structure runs along the right rear bottom of the plane. The equipment attached to the underside of the plane which hit the World Trade Center is identical in every single way to the Boeing 767s issued by Dov Zakheim. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Bring it back. The video you're watching now came from Loose Change First Edition. Did you catch that? It appears to show the FTS pod self destructing just before impact. Also, Notice that the flash is reflected in the fuselage of the plane. The flash is also present in footage taken by Evan Fairbanks, Jennifer Spell, C. 
tiene Al Qaeda certainly couldn't die this equipment at Logan International Airport and even if they did the flight crew would have noticed it so where did this plane come from another interesting piece of 9-11 evidence is the last 12 seconds of UA-175 since every amateur videographer in New York City had their cameras pointed up at the burning tower one the second plane strike was filmed from nearly every conceivable angle expert analysis of this plane leads to some startling revelations first there is the expertly controlled flight characteristics of this plane during its last 12 seconds of flight, UA-175 made a single corrective maneuver so perfectly timed and executed that it's unlikely it was piloted by human hands. One of the things that jumped out at me when I looked at the, uh, the footage or the video of uh, Flight 175 as it went into the uh, World Trade Center is it appeared to me that there was something on the under fuselage of that aircraft that did not belong there, at least not with a commercial airliner. Now, uh, I'll tell you where I have seen uh, uh, attachments that that uh, look like that on military aircraft. So the question you have to answer now is was that the commercial airliner that hit the World Trade Center or possibly was it an aircraft that looked very similar but was a military uh, type airplane? All the recorded sources, all the different photographic evidence, uh, that was produced by CNN and, and ABC. They all show this pod. It, it's there. You can see it with your own eyes. And in my professional opinion, that, that there was a pod attached to that the bottom of that aircraft, and uh, therefore it was not United Airlines Flight 175. If you take a careful look at the flight paths of American Airlines 11 and UA-175, the two flights that took off from Boston's Logan Airport and crashed into the Twin Towers, you'll find a major clue. Not only did both these planes cross paths directly over Stewart Air Force Base, but they did so at the exact same time. Another odd synchronicity is Flight 93, which had been sitting on the tarmac delayed at the airport for nearly 40 minutes with no explanation. Originally scheduled to take off at 8.01 a.m., it was delayed until the moment that Flight AA-11 crashed into the North Tower at 8.43 a.m. Another interesting piece of evidence that ties Stewart Air Force Base to the center of this 9-11 conspiracy is the white mystery plane spotted over Washington and the Pentagon. Through careful investigation, we've been able to map out the flight paths of these two ominous aircraft, which have been identified as E-4Bs, a type of aircraft that the military uses as mobile command posts. What concerns me is that both of these aircraft took off from and landed at Stewart Air Force Base. Another interesting coincidence I found was that Flight 93 turned around directly over Hopkins Airport and Flight 77 turned around directly over Tri-State Airport. Webster Tarpley has done some of the most thorough research into the war game exercises that were taking place on the day of 9-11. But this white mystery plane, the Doomsday Plane, what was it doing over the Pentagon and the White House on 9-11? Who was flying in that plane? What were they doing? Being the comptroller for the Pentagon and the chief financial officer, you have to kind of wonder what Dov Zakheim was doing on 9-11 and what his connections were to the $2.3 trillion that were missing from the Pentagon the day before 9-11. If anything, the individuals and organizations outlined in this video are at least as suspicious as the 19 hijackers themselves. They have nothing on us. I don't you. Book them, Dano.